Hey, what is up everyone? It is Rich. All right, welcome to Super Fun Sunday. Today we're gonna do something a little different and a little similar. Um, I, I had an idea a while ago that I wanted to just look through a big slew of original art. And what I've got in here is Brian Boland, Barry Windsor Smith. I've got Neil Adams, Todd McFarlane, Windsor McKay, Sal Buscema, I mean, there's a bazillion artists in here. It's going to be a really incredible video. These are all hand-picked by me. This isn't like random stuff. I really tried to grab what I considered. There's Frank Miller and Klaus Janssen. All off the original art. It's going to be super badass. We've got to get into it right now because there's a ton of shit. So let's just do this. So this is obviously Bray Windsor Smith. Uh, it's dated 1991. I believe this is a cover. For Marvel Comics Presents. I could be incorrect with that, but, um, uh, you know, very, very iconic stuff. I've actually got a short story that Bray Windsor Smith did that is Conan versus Rune. It's really cool, actually. It's very, very cool. There's so much good shit in here. Wally Wood, Jack Davis. I mean, I want to get you excited. Alex Nino, Jose Gonzalez, Esteban Moroto. I'm telling you, I went to town. It was like, it was like, um, a fantasy compiling of all kinds of killer shit. Should have grabbed some Mignola. Stop the video. So this is Barry Windsor Smith. These are just little um, uh, spot illustrations. I don't know if it was a print set that he did, but uh, they're really, really cool. Man, the detailing on this is just great. And this face is awesome. Kind of uh, a little Hal Foster-ish, actually. Um, the, this guy. Just the, probably the content more than anything. But man, Barry Windsor Smith got so good. Talk about humble beginnings. Because this is early stuff at Marvel. I may have a little tiny bit of it in here. Um... Uh, but uh yeah he really just got incredible it was funny i did a test and tried different noise suppressions audacity looks to be a um after effects i can't process a two-hour video on audacity it would just take too long um but i tried some noise suppression filters for my fan and uh, they didn't really it was too it made the audio sound like shit overall so i'm gonna probably just buy a new mic but hopefully it was weird. I did a test, too, and the freaking fan didn't come up. So this is Mark Schultz. This is from 1990. This is before I started collecting comics, but, um, man, it's great. It's got, like, a little bit of a Dave Stevens vibe to me for Zeta, Al Williamson. I mean, all the classic stuff. Um, Mark Schultz is great. Really, really beautiful brush inking in here, and, man, these figures are awesome. So this is Kniff. I've actually got some stuff in here that's really interesting. I've got some Frazetta drawings that he did in a sketchbook when he was probably a teenager or early 20s that are definitely influenced by Kniff. There's no doubt in my mind. I had mentioned that in the Kniff video that some of these archetypes, I thought I had seen Frazetta sort of riffing on them, and I, I believe to be true. So this is, hold on, I have to, this is Neil Adams, Brave and the Bold. I, I labeled them. That would, it, These videos are time-consuming to do. It's not like these files just magically pop in my lap. I mean, this took a long time to prepare, and I had to label them just to make sure that I would know what everything is. Um, but, man, this is a kick-ass page. I have some George Perez in here, too. So this is Sal Buscema, or, yeah, yeah, Sal Buscema. I thought this was a nice piece. Got a little bit of the Kirby thing going on, maybe, maybe a lot. Um... Sal is great. I don't, you know, John, his brother John, obviously, is... Uh, Sal is still alive, I believe, too, if I'm not mistaken. Because um, I had said, I shot a video earlier this morning about John Romita Sr. and said that Romita Sr. might be one of the last of these guys. Sal, I'm nearly sure, is still alive. But Sal gets a little overlooked um, from... from um, Because John was so great. So this is Sam Keith. This is from Sam M. I just thought it was an interesting piece. This is Tim Sale from, um, what was it called? Uh, Batman Ghosts. I, I, I knew I would want to call it Long Halloween. This is nice. Tim Sale was one of my early favorite um, comic book artists. When I first started collecting, I definitely took a shine to took a shine to Tim's work. And still to this day, really like, um, like to see him draw. It's just fun stuff. Sorry, my neighbor's dog. It's an Australian Shepherd, and it just immediately will start barking. They go, ahead, go in the backyard. This is a really interesting piece. So this is credited as Todd McFarlane, Greg Capullo, and Danny Mickey. Um, and man, I, I had said in a recent video um, 
how hard it is to find any scans of Danny Mickey's inks. Now, this definitely looks like I don't see a ton of Mickey in this. And in fact, it almost seems to be, in my opinion, it looks a little more like McFarlane over Capullo almost 100%. But who knows? Maybe Mickey really um, nailed the McFarlane. So this looks like Todd to me. What's interesting is in this group of pages, so this is Windsor McKay, really, really kick-ass stuff. Um, I have a whole, almost the whole issue of issue 16 of Spider-Man from McFarlane, which is a really, really rare treat, because, um, you know, how often do you really get, like, a full book? Oh, man, Windsor McKay is awesome. I, I would assume that he's probably best known for Little Nemo and Slumberland, but, I mean, he's got other stuff they did, too. It's pretty good, like, um, just, like, political context. Man, these are great. You'll see occasionally, even to this day, some comic book artists that are influenced by Windsor McKay that will throw in little, like, nods to him. This is another Windsor McKay piece. Oh, man, so cool. Yeah, it's so weird. I did a test right before I shot this video, and I opened so many apps in the background. I had Photoshop, Clip Studio, a bunch of guitar apps and stuff like that open, and recorded, and the fan didn't come on. The second I freaking start to shoot a YouTube video, it starts to cock block me. This is Wally Wood. Wally's great. This whole story was up. I didn't grab it, because it's... it's um, it was nice, but it wasn't, like, the most, uh, like, iconic Wally Wood... Uh, stuff to me so this is really cool who is this again i think this is windsor mckay yeah it's kind of an interesting piece it reminded me a little bit of like um uh maury sendek like kind of um, where the wild things are sort of rendering <laughs> i wonder if any of that art has ever sold this is will eisner i've got some great will eisner stuff in here actually if you're an eisner fan you're gonna be like stoked my concern getting this video together, not only did it take a long time to get all the files together, but I was like, man, this could be a long, long video. I'm going to try to keep it in an hour. Sal Buscema, again, trying to give Sal a little love. He's iconic. Oh, this is crazy. So someone is selling this. I don't know who it was, if Jim Jim's and Scott sold it a while back, and then someone's... Um, selling it or if jim is letting this go i always love these pieces this one in particular was my favorite and i thought alex sinclair did just a killer job coloring it but man this piece is a banger this will go for a freaking small fortune i can't even imagine embrace your wallet this is gonna be expensive <laughs> great inks from scott Oh, man. I was around these guys when they were doing all this stuff. I knew about Hush, like, almost two years before they announced it, Jim was working on it, or, like, at least 16 months. I always tell the story of this is Batman Killing Joke, obviously. Really iconic page. This sold for, I think, over 100 grand, um, but it would go for even more now. Um, uh, yeah, Jim, Jim worked on Batman Hush for so long... I could never even remember if they had announced it or not because it was I was just so used to seeing him work on it. And whenever I would be tempted to say something, I would always have to go like, "Has it been announced?" I never, I've never blew it and spilled the beans. Another really great Brian Bolin piece. I'm nearly sure I've had this in other videos, but man, this is this is another banger, as we'll call him. This Judge Dread cover is just the shit. In my comic book collection, this is one. Whenever I see it, I always have to take a second. And, bow down to the awesomeness that is Boland on this one. Oh man, it's so good. All right, this is the Frazetta stuff that had a little bit of the Kniff going on. But, I mean, you can see he's working it out. I mean, look, I've done reviews of people that draw at this level. And they and this turned into Frank Frazetta. Now these these could all be from slightly different eras. This this I mean it's his old signature. Um, but uh, sometimes too, I I do suspect that um, 
they had all these drawings and they may have had Frank sign them in his old signature at a different time, meaning that he may have signed these uh, in the 2000s. Um, cause I highly doubt that Frank just as he was sketching all these doodles, he signed them. Sometimes he would, I mean, I've seen photos of actual pages, um, that look a little more candid, but these, these look to be maybe, um, signed later, but yeah, interesting. But yeah, you know, I mean, this should be a testament to like work hard on your art and you can go places that you never even imagined because Frank is a genius. There's no doubt about it, but he had some humble beginnings too. another bowling piece. Just awesome. <laughs> His hair is great. All right, what do we got? OK, some some there's a lot of McFarlane in here. If you're a McFarlane fan, you'll be stoked. If you don't like McFarlane stuff, well, you're in for a long video. No. <laughs> this is cool. He's presenting his arms. <laughs> this is funny. I almost didn't remember this piece, to be honest. Like, seeing it, like, the head, the face is so weird that I was kind of like, I don't really remember this in the comic. But I, I didn't look at his Spider-Man, quote-unquote you know not amazing but the spider-man run as much i definitely know the first like eight to ten issues the best um as he got further into it i i didn't really go back and look at those as much uh this is um from the building this is will eisner i thought these were interesting pages because of the layouts i mean it's like you know very few people lay out pages like will eisner but this is really fantastic i mean you've got this great shot of this guy like walking out of like an office um, you know, now you feel like you're in a hallway, still in the hallway. He's got stairs, this tight shot. I mean, it's really, really genius. I mean, you definitely, in particular, like right through here, I mean, you can get a sense of Frank Miller for sure. So we could at some point do an Eisner influence chain and kind of trickle through the different branches of that. This is another just great, great Will Eisner page. Man, this is awesome. I'll kind of go slow here. But this is the shit. I'm telling you, those two Will Eisner artist editions that I got, although it's not stuff exactly like this, it's earlier in his career, they're really good. But as I said in the other video when I mentioned them briefly like a few days ago, I, I personally didn't feel, and I, I'm i not sure because I've penciled now for like 16 months, I wasn't really completely ready for the material in it in, ter in terms of being able to study it and, and break it down at a high enough level. Um, I mean, I could superficially pull things from it, but... Um, yeah, I felt like I had a ways to go before I would really be able to um, understand it. And these are just great things. But look, I mean, you kind of need that that level of humility. Confidence is great, but you need to be realistic, too. I've definitely run into people that are a little delusional about where they're at with their art. And y you'd be better off just saying, like, look, I'm a student of the game, and I want to learn the game good. You'll know when you're good because the people will be lining up like this to check out your art. If that's not happening, you might not be there yet. It's just saying, ah, oh, this is great. This looks like our dude again, Peter Lorre. He had more hair though. <laughs> Look at this this is great yeah i had to grab i there was a, there was a lot a lot of these pages but i grabbed the ones that just really kind of stood out to me um and again interesting buildings you know he's got like almost like a spanish style roof on this building these are s sort of a different thing with different window sills over here he's got these interesting tops on the buildings and then these are uh, like round like rounded tops little different bottoms it, you know, you don't need to memorize 50,000 different buildings, but three or four that you can use um, will start it rolling. And this is great, too. This is Jim Aparo. I grabbed a couple. I know there's a lot of Aparo fans out there. A lot of people uh, read Batman when Jim was working on the book, and so I wanted to show him some respects. And this is another Aparo interior page. Really nice. This first panel of Batman is really, really good, and this is a great shot, too. Another Brian Bolin Killing Joke page. These two are up for auctions. There's probably be another one that will come right after this, um, possibly. Um, but uh, they're nice, you know, not not Batman related, but they're still really, really terrific pages. 
yeah, and this is the other one. At one point, I was considering collecting bar pages, comic book pages with characters and bars. And then my fantasy was is that I would one day have a bar in my house and hang them all. <laughs> so I, right now, I have an Andrew Robinson bar page, and I have a Chris Bocello or Bacolo, um a really nice Howard the Duck uh, page with him facing off with these gangsters. I think I had a couple more. But uh, yeah, I thought that that would be kind of fun. This is Jim Lee and Scott Williams. There was an RT Bear auction that was going up, and the preview scan wasn't up yet. So it's kind of bummed because the thumbnail looked great, but um, unfortunately, they didn't have a big scan of it. But this is really, really iconic page. This will, again, go for a small fortune. Uh, people have a lot of nostalgia for this stuff. And on top of it, um, you know, these are all people that now are in their early 50s, and some of them went on to have some sort of job trajectory where they can drop hundreds of thousands of dollars on this original art. And that's not an exaggeration. Um, if you follow any of original art sales, you'll know that some stuff is going for absolutely insane numbers now. Like half a mil sometimes. I just like this. This was a comic book cover, obviously, in S Detective 69. It's just fun. Just a fun piece. And I do have actually some original art from this era. I, I picked a couple that were nice. Um, this is just a really kind of fun, fun old cover. I would, I would love to have this in a collection. It's pretty cool. This is another Brian Bowen piece. We're getting through this stuff pretty efficiently. I mean, obviously you can always pause this or even watch the video slow. If you want to look at the art a little more at a leisurely pace, just mute the audio and look at the pictures. Uh, this is Jack Davis. This is from a story. I grabbed about five pages um, from a story, and um, I really like the inks on it. Nice black blacks, chunky lines. It's just really, really well done. I grabbed a couple of killer Tales from the Crypt covers from Jack Davis, but when I grabbed these, I was like, well, hopefully these pages are good, you know, interesting, but if not, I grabbed a couple of, like, showstoppers, so... <laughs> the, the way Jack Davis draws shoes is always cracks me up. It's a very iconic thing. It rem just reminds me of like classic Mad Magazine kind of vibe, even though these this wasn't from Mad. I do have a great Mad Magazine piece that he did, though. Oh, man, it's insane. So we'll move through these a little quick because we've got so many files. All right. Again, you can always pause or zoom in on these if you need to. It's pretty cool. Always a fan of rain sequences and comic books. I always think it's just kind of fun to add some neat detail. So this is interesting. This is a stat panel from Ronan. You're going to see next the actual page itself. Um, but Frank went in. Oh, here, let's do this so we can do them back to back. So here's the page as it is. So this is a Ronan page from issue one. And then Frank... Uh, you know, if you if you look at his original art, he will cut panels out. There's enough um, Dark Knight Returns art out there where you can see that that um, you know he would he would remove panels, paste, paste panels in, resize stuff. Uh, but anyway, this is really beautiful inks. I mean, Frank is just so good at inking. And then this is what he ultimately, um, I guess, replaced it with, changed the, the the character look a little bit. I think this almost feels like it could be Wolverine or. Um, like I don't know some some Marvel character. This this definitely feels more like the character in the book. All right, more McFarlane from Spider-Man sixteen, his final Marvel full comic book. I don't think he's ever gone back and done a full book for Marvel since this. What's interesting too is I always point this out um, is. This is this is the precipice of these guys. Todd, in the back of his mind, probably knew that he was quitting Marvel at this point. I know that there's like a story of him um, having a cover corrected or blood in the book, and he was like, you know what, screw this, I'm out of here. But um, 
you know, I always think that their exit books are interesting, meaning the last book that they did at the company, because you kind of, you can fantasize that they kind of knew that they were leaving and going to strike out and try this new thing. But look, the reality is, is nobody knew what image would do. They hope there's some black that he missed filling in right here. Um, uh, do you see the X's and the thigh? Um, but, um, uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things where I mean there was no guarantee that this that, that Image Comics could have completely stiffed. They could have gone and done it, and the fans might have just gone, "Well, we love your art, but we love Marvel's characters more." That really ultimately didn't end up being the case. But um, you know, there was no guarantees. They actually did take a big risk, and what comes with big risk, you know it, big rewards. And they were rewarded handsomely. <laughs> and they, you know, overall, most of them delivered, at least over a period of like five years. There was a little, a little spotty track record with some of them releasing stuff. These pieces, too, were interesting. They, they look like they had all been framed. I think that these all came from like one collector's collection. And what it looked like he did is he framed each piece with a color version of the page. And, um,. I didn't bother saving those scans. I could always go back and grab them later. But um, so this is interesting that he's not filling in the blacks here. I'm wondering if um, I'd have to look at the 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 page in the book, but they could have just dropped in Spidey's costume color. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I'm not saying that he missed blacks there because that could be just um, the blue, you know, the blue pencil making it look like it would have been shaded in. Todd, Todd generally will indicate with X's sometimes when he's going to fill in blacks, even though I'm sure a lot of times he didn't. But, uh, you know, you kind of pop him in as a reminder. It almost becomes habit. <laughs> Spider-Man pose is funny right here. That rubberiness uh, translates to really dynamic figures in other, other times. So that's what's kind of cool about it. Mass Juggernaut stuff is great. I've never drawn Juggernaut, but man, he's cool. I always find um, seeing um, Todd's drawings and inks and stuff like that in these black and white forms really, really interesting. It's something that I, I just feel like you could go back for a long period of time and really check them out. So this is the um, the Barry Windsor Smith um, Conan Rune story. And I, I downloaded the whole story, so we'll move fast through some of these. But um, this was done in 1995. It's, it's pretty good. Honestly, there's some really, really nice stuff in here. The thing is, is people love Weapon X. Um, and if you see this work in black and white, and you see the Weapon X work in black and white, you realize that actually um, he still was really, really delivering almost the same thing. It's just that people, you know, love that other story more. But he was still really kicking some serious ass in the 90s, for sure. Mass is great. But yeah, you throw Wolverine's hair on the sky and the pipes, and then this is like, you know, a $200,000 page. <laughs> what, and Barry Windsor Smith even said this. He drew like a bush one time and a threw a skeleton in it and said the reason they put the skeleton in it is because the original will sell it's the same thing it's, these art collectors they're very predictable put wolverine's hair on conan it's worth more money <laughs> this guy's cool yeah i thought this stuff was really interesting it's it's really nicely done man Man, that like the first panel is great. This is cool. Ah, that's really good. And this is badass too. Badassery. Very cool. Very cool. I like this. He draws these gem things, crystals, really good. There's a couple of shots of them. All right. Ah, oh, man, the storytelling here is great. And this this kind of harkens back to like what he learned from Jack Kirby, to be 100% honest. Drawn in a different style, but 
these are definitely Jack Kirby directing cues for a fight scene. Six panel grid. You've got nice tight shots. Incredible action. These these two shots right here are great. This is how you draw a fight scene, friends. And I was talking about it, like the tight the tighter you pull in, things coming in and out of the panels, um, contraction and then expansion. Um, like Conan's arms are kind of tight in right here, and then he elevates them. Things like that really create a level of uh, excitement. Um, you can also do it with arms um, together, like uh, oh, let me go the brush. Like like this guy's arms are kind of tighter together, and then when he gets hit, his arms go out like this. So you get a lot of like you know closed, open. All that stuff really helps create a level of dynamics. This is great too. My first fight scene was boring and stiff, and I oh like it was just overly explained, and it was just as generic as could be. But after I had to do a couple, I started going like, oh, you know what works better is like this this idea. So, you know, and that's just kind of how it goes. If you went back and probably looked at Barry's early stuff, it would be the same because I've I've seen it with other people. You almost draw it too literally. These are like, man, it's just like craziness. It's a little bit of the less is more too. Like you know, his face dipping out of the panel here. Stuff is covered up. I mean, you don't see like uh, all, both arms or both legs. This is like kind of you know coming in and out. That all really helps. Oh, this is great too. Man, guy, it's crazy. So much work too. This is a tremendous amount of work. This is awesome. Barry does just great arms and hands. Man, they're so powerful. Okay. I almost think that I, I have some stuff that, that was done around the time of Red Nails. Let's, let's move through these a little quicker now. As like I said, I've got so much art. It's probably panels really cool. Um, uh, but it was inked by someone else it might have been inked by sal Buscema, funny enough but it's i think old conan this was the this was the first piece that i saw and i was like oh this is kind of cool it looks like a little bit more of like a casual sketch but still really really well done and then i when i found out it was a whole story i was like Ooh, okay brian boland freaking phenomenal man it's so creepy God, it's great. He's so good. It's crazy how tight that he draws all this stuff, too. This, he's not fudging anything. This is a Frazetta. Really, really cool. I feel like this has maybe been up for sale before. But it's just a fantastic piece. This guy's so creepy. It's interesting seeing Frank's work at this stage. He's really, really good, but it's there's some interesting like structural stuff that he's doing. Keeps it loose. Be curious of how long something like this would take him at that point. You know, we all know that he's he was could be very fast. This is Jack Kirby and Vince Coletta. I might have actually had these in the other video. Um, there was a couple that were interesting in here. It's like a six page story or eight page story. I just grabbed a few of them. Michael Golden, really, really kick-ass piece. I feel like this one has sold a few times before, too. Some pieces just do that. Collectors get them, and then for whatever reason, they don't retain them as long as uh, other pieces. Sometimes you get something, and you're like, this thing isn't going to go anywhere, or at least not for 20 or 30 years. Other stuff, you get it, and kind of in person, you kind of... you. I don't know, you just see it on Heritage. Some pieces will sell a few times. This is really cool. So this is from a different issue than 16. I can't remember what issue the lizard is in. 8, 7, 9? Maybe it's even lower. 
I, you know, it, it's interesting because I guarantee when Todd sold these, if he sold them a long time ago, he really didn't get nearly the money that uh, he could have gotten for them. But uh, Todd's doing okay, so that's that's the good news. So this is interesting. So this is Jim Lee from Hush. Um, obviously, Poison Ivy. His buildings are very Frank Miller, Klaus Jansen. I mean, both Scott and Jim are big fans of that. But, you know, this feels right out of, like, Dark Knight Returns, the, the background. Really beautiful stuff. These guys have just delivered for years and years and years and years. Great, great stuff. So many good things. Deathblow cover up for sale right now. Go get it. It will only cost you a small fortune. <laughs> Although, again, this, you know, if this was a Marvel piece, it would sell for more because more people have nostalgia for that. But this is a nice Deathblow cover. was really really like one of my favorite uh, early comics that I collected just for the potential of the style not even just the book itself but I mean you just saw this and went like this looks cool you know I like this this look uh, more McFarlane from 16 this was pretty crazy because this is the Twin Towers right and he has this, like, them burning. Man, it's nuts. I forgot about that. Todd really did improve. Well, not, not, not that he technically improved, but but the, like, he drew the last couple issues of Spider-Man. They're, they're nice drawings. When he got on spawn, I mean, he definitely looked like he was being more disciplined and really trying to actually push himself um, to to do, you know, the best work that he could. But this is great, man. This will go for a ton. Oh my god. Yeah, whoever bought these, if they got them a while ago, they're gonna make bank on their investment like crazy. I can't even imagine. I will say this though that that I found it interesting that you would sell all of this stuff at one time. The only reason being is that there's, in my opinion, a limited amount of collectors that have the kind of money that this stuff would cost, and um, you you know like like if they're buying one or two pieces, then if you're selling like twenty pages at once, um, you're gonna kind of dilute them. I mean, obviously the type of person that can drop over a hundred thousand dollars on comic art probably has got pretty deep pockets but even then you know in the back of their mind they're going do i really want to spend seven hundred thousand dollars on these five pieces or whatever it is and some of these will be more i mean a lesser double page spread of these would probably go for 50 to eighty thousand, i would think maybe more though but the nice pages are going to go for a freaking ton this is so crazy I'd be curious of how many comic books had the World Trade Towers um, attacked in them. I know that there's definitely more than just this, um, but uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty weird. This is cool. This is a Dave Dorman piece. This is um, uh, the reason that I pulled it. It was one Dave Dorman. I don't I don't think gets as much um, credit as as he should. Um, but um, when I first started collecting these Dark Empire, I'm pretty sure this is from Dark Empire, um, uh, I, I really like these comic books, and so I, I bought all these um, and have them, and uh, I always thought they were cool, so it was really neat to be able to see one of the covers as an original. He got some really beautiful textures down here. There's a tutorial that you can find of Dave Dorman teaching painting. Um, I was like a DVD or something, and... Um, he he breaks one of the cardinal rules of painting, which is um, he mixes oil with acrylic the way that you're not supposed to. I just thought this was a cute cover, so I threw this in as just a rando. But uh, I thought this wolf dog in this little poster was um, <laughs> kind of funny. The color too, like I don't know what this was when it originally printed, but the, the that off pink kind of color was just sort of funny. This is just cool. I saw this, I was like, oh, I'll throw this in too. Man. I love the Hulk. I've got some other Hulk stuff in here. You'll see in a minute. 
So this was interesting. This was a John Romita Jr. story that someone was selling, like a whole book. And I grabbed about eight or nine pages um, and uh, thought I could share some John Romita Jr. stories. So I think John Romita Jr. for a very brief amount of time, maybe five or six years ago, might have even been a little longer now, um, and uh, was interesting. We did, I don't even know, probably close to 100 pages together, something like that, maybe a little bit less. Um, he had the, the thing is, is he had so many inkers that he'd worked with that I was so far down the list of like his choices um, that I just think everybody that he normally worked with was booked. But I mean, it's like he works with Al Williamson. He works with Scott Hanna. He works with, I mean, Sandra Hope. I mean, there was like, you know, 10 inkers before me. But anyway, I was lucky enough to work with him for a while. And um, he pencils pretty loose. It's all there. But but um, he he seemed to wait until the last minute to do stuff like some pencilers do. There was like, I think he responded to the pressure of the deadline. He may have been very busy in his regular life or just manages his time differently. But um, yeah, a lot of it was kind of in panic mode. Um, and, uh, overall you really kind of have to bring a, a level of finish to the table or his stuff will be illegible or not illegible, but, um, it can look real flat or just not read well. I'd have sequence with rain and he just kind of, you know, it was like side of the pencil, like kind of go for it, which is cool. It's the old, that's an old school approach that, that if you're an inker, and work through the 2000s most pencilers are control freaks and so i liked it it just took it was like there was a little bit of like kind of um adjustments that you had to make because it was like it's all here for sure he he's no joke this dude knows how to draw his ass off um but you definitely had to have um some drawing skills or he was gonna um be a real challenge so he wasn't messing around you know what I mean? It was like he he drew it in a very, very professional way. But professional, like old, old, not old school, but like not not uh, post image stranglehold pencils. <laughs> I had to do a whole sequence with these people that were like getting sucked into like a computer thing and there was like no line weights on anything but imagine this but like a double page spread like this background and i mean i had to choose all the line weights to have stuff separate it was really really challenging so at some point i'll do a video on um I, I i used to upload um works in progress when i was working on this stuff i don't know if they're still on my channel um but um i have the videos still to this day so i could always re um put fresh audio on them yeah, and John's done so many iconic titles. This is great. Whoever inked these, I can't remember who it was. They did. They actually did a terrific job. And then this was the the piece that caught my eye. Oh, so, oh, it's Klaus Janssen. That's right. It was Klaus Janssen on the whole job, actually. So my apologies, but yeah, I mean, Klaus Janssen's another one that's in his, um, you know, what do you call it, like phone list of like inkers. So I'm just, you know. I'm small potatoes compared to those guys. What kind of potatoes? I'm like the little purple ones. <laughs> More McFarland. Like I said, I had to grab these for myself. It was as much as they were for the video. I mean, it's like I would want to have these in my collection of JPEGs anyway. So, so this is a Bill Sienkiewicz Electra Assassin page. I thought it was really cool. It's not the best one that's ever gone up on Heritage, but <clears throat> I thought it added a little spice to the video take you down memory lane it's crazy that he inked this with like red red ink or red dye pretty cool i mean it could even be marker but i don't know so this is the arthur adams piece i thought this was pretty cool this is up for sale art's crazy this is actually this is kind of old old school not old school but this was done 10 2000 okay so yeah so it was done 22 years ago art art actually this is when he was first starting to really kind of do more of this background um but these lines are more chaotic the way that he's laying them down he got way more controlled with like his fade lines um but these are like the early attempts at it like even the rendering on like the jacket you can see that the, the lines kind of go different directions he got more conscious conscious of the direction that his rendering lines would go um, 
and not just like little crisscrosses. So this is Barry Windsor Smith pencils. Let me level this just a little bit. It's a little darker so we can see it because depending on your monitor, you might not be able to see it. You can see Barry almost always uses blue pencil under his pencils. But this is a pretty cool piece. And you know he would ink the shit out of this. Uh, this is a Frazetta Remark. So, um, you know, um, probably in the mid-2000s, um, they started doing more prints and stuff like that. Odds are Frank drew this left-handed, too. Um, and uh, it's really terrific. You know, it's really, really good. But, yeah, most of these Remarks, if I'm not mistaken, were done probably around 2005-ish. Um, and they were left-handed. Man, it's so good. It's great. His pencil line is killer. Even left-handed. Jim Lee, Scott Williams, Killer Instinct, cover six, I think. Badass piece. This is when Jim and Mark Silvestri turned into one artist. <laughs> or Mark Mark started to draw more like Jim. But uh yeah, there was a point where like their their styles were really, really similar. Is this is some unusual structure for Jim? Like these are some wild style, um, like necks and chins and stuff like that, which to me is kind of more of a characteristic of Sylvester stuff. I mean, I know these are these two are Sylvester characters, but so this was cool. I did grab one manual piece. So this is obviously Death in the Family cover, um, and a very very iconic cover. This will go for a ton of money, and. Uh, Mignola probably sold this a million years ago for like a hundred bucks or two hundred dollars, and uh, now it will go for probably a couple hundred grand. <laughs> Mike's doing okay though, he's another one. We don't have to worry about Mignola, he should be fine. The ones you want to worry about are uh, the uh, the ones that didn't have the success of these other guys. Another, uh, so look, here he goes. Here's his goodbye. We love you, Todd. You Todsta. To all of you readers of the past few years, thanks. It's been a blast. He's like, I'm going to go make millions of dollars with this Image Comics thing and thumb my nose at DC and Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. This is a 300 cover. Oh my God. I love Frank Miller. I, yeah, man, Frank is so good. This stuff is just badass. This is probably the last great book that he drew. His health just, I think, declined after this. And, um, you know, it just gets difficult as you get older. If you have any kind of health issues, then, man, you, that compounds things. But 300 to me is, is I, I, whenever I bring it up, I, I really do think that it's, it's, it's incredible. It's really, really good. Like, I, I don't think people realize how good it is. They really should try to do an artist edition of it because it's phenomenal. And and Lynn's colors were great on it too. Don't get me wrong. This is great too. Jim Jim Lee had a lot of this in his uh, Marvel stuff. You could see where he was very influenced by like these lines and stuff. And 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 Jim carries it over. You know, even to this day when Jim makes him, himself. Uh, the lines are not not like this flat, but uh, th this is kind of how he sets things up. Beautiful cover. This sold a while ago, but man, talk about iconic, dude. Oh my gosh. This video is, is a heavy hitter, man. There's so much good shit in here. For anyone that's stuck it out this far, you know that you're reaping the rewards of this. I'll probably end up watching this video over the next week a few times. Because when I'm shooting them, I don't really get to enjoy the art to the same level of... Uh, these are Dark Knight Returns pages. Man, it's so cool. Um, I don't really get to see everything and pick up all the like small details. There's another one. Wanted to make sure that I covered some nice Frank Miller for you all. Uh, this is Jose Gonzalez. So, like I had said about two days ago, I did a video and I, I was thinking of Jose Gonzalez, but I said Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. 
Um, so I covered both bases in this video. You're going to get some Jose Gonzalez and Jose Luis Garcia Lopez and Esteban Moroto and some Alex Nino coming up here in just a second. Hold tight, friends. Jackson's about ready to have a, a heart attack because he loves all those guys. Look at this. Man, this is good shit. The way that this guy drew women is so iconic. It's just so, like, man. And look, they're shooting her up. They're like, you're going to do some drugs. And we're going to go cause trouble. This chick's a strong mother. <laughs> she sure is. She's Vampirella. She's going to kick all your asses. And look sexy doing it. Man, the, the wash effects on this are really cool. Oh, man, it's such a good drawing. Dude. <laughs> All right, this is John Totlebein. Tot Totlebein. Is that how you say it? Totlebein. I saw this and just went, like, I'm going to give John some love. It's got, like, a Metropolis vibe. These are Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, right? Yeah, these were done for Batman or for licensing, DC licensing. I've talked about licensing before. They, um, I've actually inked some Jose Luis Garcia Lopez licensing stuff. Um, not over the original pencils. They usually would just send me scans. But um, yeah, you know, um, DC will say, hey, we need like five Batman drawings. Send us like twenty examples, and we need them for lunch boxes and kids' T-shirts and skateboards and backpacks and. You know, we're gonna do a coloring book, whatever it is, and so um, they they they're they're pretty nice paying jobs. It's a one and done. You know, you do them, you you're never gonna get royalties on or anything like that. But uh, they pay over normal rate, and uh, they're little smaller drawings. You know, less work than a page. This is cool. So this is Coletta and Kirby. Uh, this is. Jack Kirby and Senate. Oops, sorry. Bam! And if I made any mistakes in this video, please let me know. If for some reason I credited something wrong or got some information right, you know, I, I do the best that I can on these videos and, um, you know, I'm limited. So Jim Starlin, we definitely need to do a Jim Starlin video. I'm not super knowledgeable on Jim Starlin's work, but I know that he's really good. And I've definitely poured over his work um, a couple of times on my own just to explore it. And I really liked it. Um, and he hits that that sort of sweet spot for me, which is for some reason, I, I do like the 60s and 70s Marvel stuff. It just, um, you know, like I said, I kind of equate it to like a kid now liking like 80s music. It just, there's something about it that feels like kind of comics, you know. There are those rare kids out there today that still grow up and like the old stuff. It's very funny. There's a guitarist that I fall online who's 15. He has autism and uh, was having a real rough time and discovered guitar. And he completely came out of his shell, but he's a huge Stevie Ray Vaughan fan. And, uh, man, the kid completely changed his life. In two years, he went from being basically, like, locked in his bedroom, scared to go outside, like, would sleep all day. He was really in a bad spot. And, uh, man, guitar just brought him out of it. It's really cool. And he plays great, too. That's the other thing. He hyper-focused on guitar. This kid is going to be a fucking monster. <laughs> so this was a recreation. This is John Buscema recreation of this cover. And um, it's really nice. My my speculation is that he probably never got this piece back. It may have been stolen from Marvel or just sat around long enough where they quote-unquote threw it out. Stolen. Um <laughs> I'm not saying that this piece was originally stolen though. It, it may have it may have been returned to him and he sold it or something like that and then he did a recreation just because. But um you know, a lot of the quote unquote missing Marvel stuff I believe um uh just was taken, not thrown out. I'm sure they did throw out some stuff, but I, I find it hard to believe that people that were fans of comic art were just going like, Yeah, let's just throw out a big pile of Jack Kirby stuff. I don't buy it. Um so this is John Buscema and Al Williamson. This is a Wolverine cover. It's great. Um, and, uh, yeah, really, really cool. Williamson ended up inking a lot. So this is Jack Davis. All kinds of killer. Oh, yeah, so these are the covers that I grabbed. 
So Tales from the Crypt. But this was nice. Anytime you can get a girl in a bikini in peril, I say do it. <laughs> there was a funny... Oh, this is, was awesome. This is from, from Mad Magazine. So this is Jack Davis. This is a great piece. We'll uh, slowly scroll down it. Man. So I see Marlon Brando. There's probably a lot of, like, I don't know, these movie references. I'm not really sure. But uh, that's cool. He looks familiar to me, but... Blue suede shoes. I don't know what this is. Is this a movie? Crazy. Oh, that's funny. I mean, not that that was a reference to it, but... Um, I, I remember seeing an interview with Gerard Way, and he was talking about that he collected Mad Magazine as a kid, but then there were the two copy Mad Magazines, which was crazy and cracked. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, he goes, sometimes I would get cracked, but it just wasn't as funny or as good as Mad. And I remember the same thing as a kid. You'd be like, ah, oh, like there's no Mad Magazine. All right, I'll get cracked. And it's like, you knew even at a young age that the art was like a little like not as good and that the, the humor, like the writing <laughs> wasn't as good. So this is another Jack Davis piece. This is great. Man, this is so good. Yeah, you can't get too much past kids, honestly. Like, we're, we're dumb when we're kids, but there's also, there's an observation skill that kids have that is pretty high, too. Man, this is so cool. Great hands. Again, it's interesting, too, is because this is kind of like, if you look at the line work on Jack's hands, it is it is similar to what Barry Windsor Smith does, which is, this is a very swirly approach to the actual like topography on him. Um, and uh, it really looks good. Man, this is all good shit. So this is how Foster... Um, Tarzan, I guess. Yeah. Very yellow. Let me see. I, I'll cut, try to pull out some of the yellow, see if it helps a little. Yeah, it's a little better. Look, I fixed your original for you, free of charge. <laughs> that original got real yellow. I don't know what, what was going on, where it was being stored. The bowels of hell? Possibly the bowels of hell. Yeah, man. How Foster is good. All right, what do we got? Oh, uh, this is George Perez. Yeah. And, and actually, hold on, let me see something there. Okay, just George Press. I have one George Press piece that I think was inked by someone kind of interesting. This may have been in my Perez tribute video. I kind of remember, like, the hand. Yeah, yeah, I remember this. Okay, so we, we saw this in the Perez tribute video. So this is um, Gil Kane and Joe Sinnott. These two in one books were kind of cool. I grabbed a few from back issue bins, but I was never really sure. So when they would do books like this, are these reprints? Marvel gets tricky with that stuff where, where, um, like as a collector, it's a little confusing if you don't have like a peer group to explain what's going on. Uh, is this, this is Gil Kane and Frank Giacoa. Again, a little out of my wheelhouse in terms of, like, my knowledge base. I'm not, you know, I mean, the Silver Age stuff is expensive. It's tricky to find, and um, I just don't have a, a huge collection of it or an awareness of it. I appreciate it, of course. So this is George Perez, and is someone else? No. I do have a bunch of these Teen Titans books, though. I bought a collection off of a guy about five years ago. His his collection had a lot of this. This is what was this one? This is George Perez Wizard Comics Magazine one forty four. I guess cover. I don't remember um, seeing this one at the time. I must not have been following Wizard Magazine when they got up to the hundred and forty fours. That would have been geez, probably two thousand two. So I was busy working. I call those the lost years. <laughs> so this is, <coughs> excuse me, George Harriman, Crazy Cat. I love George Harriman's work. Um, 
I just, it's got a lot of energy. It's really cool. Not all the strips are like mind blowers, but the best of the best are really, really incredible. But you know, he's telling a story or gags or whatever it is, and so just, you know, some of them are, they're they're still cool, but he's really good. When you, the best of the best will will really impress you. Like this is fun. I like this. I love this style of art. It's just cool looking. Oh, art, 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 art. Everywhere there's art. Man, his line is really freaking lively. Look at this. Nothing boring about this little cactus at all. Man, it's good shit. This is Gene Colan and Joe Sinnott. Very iconic piece, I would imagine. Sharon, you're giving your heart, your trust to the deadliest menace on Earth. Tell him, Red Skull. Don't trust Captain America. Far worse than death. This is really cool. This is Gene Colon, Tony De Zuniga. Man, that is really cool. Yep, that is badass. God. So many great ideas in these um these videos that's why i'm saying all this stuff is gonna so this is a frazetta sequential that was really really cool some of them were credited with two people and i didn't really understand what that meant exactly but um i don't know if if um maybe uh, frank did parts of it and the other person did i'm not saying this one but um one of the other ones that i had it that did have two names so they they you know like i said i'm not an expert at this era of frazetta but Sometimes the job just needed to get in. If it took two people, then so be it. This is another one of those. Or this is different, but uh, you can really see, see the Hal Foster influence on um, these. It's funny, too, because these both look like Frank. <laughs> it's like Frank with a fancy wig. He's like, Roy, you're coming to my house and taking photos. He's like, what? He's like, and bring the wig. He's like, oh, God, not again, Frank. <laughs> I'm kidding. He probably just drew this stuff, but uh, anyway. Gotta have someone. So this is Gasoline Alley. This is really cool shit, too. Alright. What was this one? I'm trying to remember. It's so many. Oh, so this is Frank Miller, Klaus Jansen. Yeah, I just want to make sure. It's, I'm starting to blur out. This is a lot of, this is a lot of wear and tear on my eyes. This is Frank and Klaus too. I gotta work for like at least five or six hours today after this. I'm gonna be beat up. Thanks YouTube! No, just kidding. <laughs> These are my vitamins, my art vitamins. This is from Dark Knight Returns. Awesome sauce. Okay, this is Alex Nino. No, Esteban Moroto. This is good shit. Look at this. Oh my god, this guy is so good. This was some crazy, like, 70s shit they were on. It's like Frazetta, psychedelic, just really stylish lines, crazy patterns. Oh man, it's so cool. The first time you see this guy's stuff, if it's if it's something that's gonna click for you, you're just like, what the hell is this? For me, it was probably a reprint of one of those either Conan or Vampirella magazines, and you like flip through it and you see this and you just go, okay, like I need to find more of this stuff. This is really cool. Man, these guys were just badasses. I've got a few pieces from this guy. Nineteen ninety three or seventy three? Seventy three. He writes his sevens like me. I throw the cross on him. No way it doesn't look like a upside down flipped L. No. <laughs> Did Rich mean L there? Look at this. This is so good. Oh my god. Dude. This would look beautiful with like some watercolor on it. Man. I mean it looks killer in black and white, don't get me wrong, but Oh boy, like with some really, really great 
watercolor boy would be beautiful too i'd like both versions i need more wall space i have no room for posters it sucks that like oh so this is del kion uh someone else inked it though i didn't write down who the inker was but uh yeah it says kion pencils and someone else's inks on this one but nice nice whole cover he's wearing his short shorts his lemmy shorts his pants ripped so much that they ripped all the way up there. This was Dick Ayers and John Severn. I thought this was kind of a fun, a fun piece. I you know I figure some people are probably like war comics fans. You know, especially if you have been collecting for a long time, it's not as common now. Obviously, it hasn't been for a long time. But um, and DC would do some occasionally. But uh, yeah, these were these were kind of cool. You know, sort of interesting. King size special. This is from The Watchmen. Dave Gibbons. All right. This was, who's this? Dave Cockrum and someone, who was being, Rubenstein, that's right, Joseph Rubenstein. This is a great cover, man. I, I thought this was fantastic. I'm not 100% sure I'd ever seen this. It looks kind of familiar, but, but uh, man, this is a really good one. Really, really good. Man, it's kick ass. This is Dave Cockrum and Neil Adams, okay. I'm guessing Neil inked it. How many ways can Robin die? Well, according to DC's history, many. This was whoops. This is Don Adkins. Dan Adkins. Uh, I thought this was kind of cool. It had the old school flavor. Doctor Strange. It's big business. Trying to get views, folks. No. <laughs> That's why I put this 45 minutes into the video with no nod to it. This was interesting. This was... What was this? This is David Lloyd, and the book is called Warrior? I said it was kind of an interesting, like, laid out page. Oh, is Oh, Okay. It looks like that dude. <laughs> you don't know the dude's name? I haven't read every single comic. I'm doing my best, people. Anonymous. <laughs> it was credited as Warrior. Is the name of the comic Warrior? Or is it V for Vendetta? I'm confused. Uh, oh, okay, so this was the Barry Windsor Smith stuff that, that looked like it might possibly been kind of around when he did Red Nails. Now, I'm not sure if he did it before or after, but this is um, not him inking himself, so that's why it, it has more of a generic uh, Marvel look. But I believe it's Sal Buscema inks on these. And this was also in the same thing. I think this one had a little bit more of the Red Nails vibe, but again, it's just not inked with all the, the detail. But you wouldn't really know. I mean, that's the thing is, like, people see stuff like that and they'll go, oh, like, Barry Windsor Smith was so much better on himself. But they take it that extra mile. If you see, like, if you saw the pencils, the inker might have done everything that was there. But it's just, you you don't know what to expect. So this is Barry Windsor Smith inking. Or no, this is not him inking himself, though. This is uh, Terry Austin. Terry and Barry, although their names sound interesting together, they're, they're a little bit of a weird combo. I think it could definitely work, but, um, yeah, Terry's got such an accurate line and it's so, um, like thin to thick that, uh, Windsor Smith has got a little more wild stuff. This was just cool. This is, um, Bob Kane and Jerry Robinson, I think, right? Yeah. Bob Kane, Jerry Robinson. Man, this is such a kick-ass piece. It's really cool. I like the Robin a lot, actually. All right, we're getting towards the end. This was... Oh, is this the last one? Uh, did I put the name of this one? Hold on. Okay, this is Basil Wolverton and Steve Grover, and it's called Stratosphere. Or wait, no. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Basil Wolverton, and the book is Steve Grover of the Stratosphere Patrol. I just thought this was an interesting piece. We just have a couple more, and we're done. 
Um, and we've got a couple of bangers actually at the end. Um, I, I thought this was really nice. It's just kind of cool looking, like weird art. If I see some of those unusual ones, look at this. So this is Alex Nino. Man, this is kick ass. Look at the lines in the background. This guy is nuts. I'll zoom out in a second. Let me, I'll even darken it a little and pull the saturation down. Just so that it's like a little more easy on the eyes to read. Man, that is so kick ass. Wow, this is so weird. It's like all these little skeleton guys hanging out. They're like little children's skeletons. The fairies. The Pied Piper of skeletons. Creepy trees. It's kind of like Sam Keithish. <laughs> or, um, yeah, it's funny. Oh, look at this. This was crazy, too. This is when your splatter game has gone off the grid. He splattered it all up. I'm going to darken this just a little bit so we can see it a little better. Yeah, the splatter almost, like, overwhelmed it. Boy, that is beautiful, though, right? Damn. Yeah, he almost should have masked off a little bit of the building and hit the background with the splatter and then just done a little bit of a lighter splatter on maybe the um, the key focal points because it's a little... I mean, the scan could be a little bright. Um, this is Alex Nino. But man, it sure is cool looking. Oh, sorry. And this is Alex Nino too. Is a beast. So this looks like that duo shade paper. Man, this is good. Oh man, this is really good actually. That is so killer. Jeez. He created so much space. This this open panel here, I mean, honestly, the amount of drawings that he's got on this double page spread is absolutely crazy. Because like he he used the real estate so good. I'm telling you. Because this is huge. This is this gives you such a big shot of this action, and it's so enjoyable. I mean, that that could have easily just been what was on the double page spread, and it was plenty. He's got these two great establishing panels up here that lead off the action, and then this whole tier of this, and none of them are so small that you can't enjoy it. Nothing is wasted here. Every shot is just big enough where you can really clearly read it. This is a phenomenal double page spread. Boy, he knocked it out of the park on this. This is Art Adams Micronauts. 1983. Man, that's cool. And... This is the last piece. I just threw this in because this was the thumbnail for um, the John Romita Sr. video. And um, I didn't have it in the video because I grabbed it afterwards. I wanted a color um, image for the thumbnail. But, man, talk about an iconic cover. doesn't really get much more than this. This is just fantastic. I feel like I have seen a black and white of this original. It may have been in the artist edition that IDW did. But, okay, so that's Super Fun Sunday. I got to get to work. I'm a little I'm a little off my schedule. I was hoping to be done with all these videos by 1030, but it did. It took a tremendous amount of time to get all these files together because, like I said, I try to handpick things that are good, and it, takes, it just takes time, and I had to label all these so that I would know the names of things that I might, I was concerned I would slip up on. But anyway, you have a great deal. Make sure to smash the like. Definitely subscribe if you haven't. I mean, the big buzz around YouTube is that most of the time, like 40% of the people that watch your videos are subscribed. If you made it to the end of this and you're not subscribed, please do. I mean, I don't I don't really spam my channel. I generally will upload one video a day in the morning um, of these 10 minutes with, and um, we're having a good time. So the subscription would help me. I'm really trying to get my channel to 30,000 subscribers. It's been a long-term goal for me for years here. So let's do it. All right, I'll talk to you later. And if you can, share my channel. If you made it to the end of the video and you're already subscribed, Share it. Tell people. If you follow other comic book channels, say if you like this, you should definitely check out 
Rich's channel. I've done the good work. There's over 600 videos on on YouTube for you guys. That's what it, what YouTube tells me. So, all right, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Have a great Sunday.